though the authority of them all remained only in Augustus. Right? A reference to a point I'll <coughs> say a little bit more about later that Augustus's policy was to maintain many of the forms of Republican governance while in fact being uh, sole ruler in uh, the uh, fundamental sense. Similarly, one, one more passage right there. Uh, as Augustus is sick and people begin talking about the future, this is how Tacitus describes it, what's going on. Again, positive translation. Some few there were that discoursed in vain of the commodities of liberty. More feared war. Some desired it. But the greatest number by far, with diversity of rumors, did descant on those that were to be their next lords. Their imminentes uh, dominos. Uh, you see. So, so what is that? Uh, and Hobbes comments on that. He, long comments, sort of a page comment on pretty much each couple of sentences of, of Tacitus. The, the, the comment I want to mention here is, is this, for liberty they had no hope at all. But yet that was also talked of, for men have generally this infirmity, that when they would fall into consideration of their hopes, they mistake and enter into a fruitless discourse of their wishes. Such impression do pleasing things make in man's imagination. So, in other words, Hobbes' interpretation, and I, I agree, I think that is the only way truly to take what Tacitus is saying, is that, yes, some few talked of liberty, it was empty talk. In fact, uh, Tacitus uses the word in casum, in vain, fruitless talk of what is good about liberty, the goods of liberty, commodities of liberty. But uh, that is not a serious alternative. Other people, most people fear <coughs> war. I think war there means civil war. Fear of civil war. Some, a smaller number, but there are always some who might hope to restore or advance their fortunes by civil war. Some desired it, many feared it. But most, what do most do? They gossip about their political rulers. Right? That's what happens with, uh, that's what public discourse becomes when serious participation in choosing rulers or deciding policies is not available. We gossip about our masters. Right? And in this case, various gossip is passed around about their likely future uh, masters. Um, <coughs> rethinking that, as I say, uh, probably or jaundiced view of advanced years uh, passes, it does seem to be in fact obvious that uh, his judgment is no, no possibility of restoration of Republican institutions. He makes that clear in several other places as well. Uh, I just chose here the most obvious and, 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 and best known, which I had not adequately reflected on myself before in, in thinking it was still a kind of an open question. I think for Tacitus, it isn't. The things which led to the end of the Republic, the necessity of transforming it into one-man rule, uh, were, 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 were not reversible in, in, in any uh, imaginable circumstances that were faced at the time of the death of Augustus or any time during Tacitus's lifetime. So he, I believe he's not addressing that question, but, but he is doing what is, in a way, more obvious what he is, that, that he is doing, namely, seeking to try to understand imperial rule, one-man rule. Uh, and I think he has always been read as a, a classic in the analysis of what one-man rule is like, imperial, monarchical, despotic, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and uh, uh, his, his uh, fundamental question, it seems to me, is how can one best live under such a regime? How, how can one live under such a regime uh, which has very grave 
dangers and defects, <laughs> to be sure. Now, before turning to some remarks on his major writings, the two, the two historical writings, uh, I'd like to say uh, this about his three short earlier writings. I think one can profitably view those three short earlier writings as framing uh, the basic questions which he wishes to pursue or upon which he wishes to shed further light in writing his long histories, his, his histories and his annals, as they are respectively called. <clears throat> and there are three shorter writings in the probable order of composition. They are the Agricola, which is a uh, eulogistic uh, biography of his deceased father-in-law. Uh, the Germania, or De Moribus Germaniae, uh, a writing on Germany, which is uh, uh, as, as is, is, is uh, ethnographic. Uh, it's about the Germans. Rousseau, why I'm referring to Rousseau all the time, but Rousseau in the first discourse refers to, uh, as part of his theme, about how the historian, tired of viewing the crimes and degeneracy and so on, in, in his own uh, uh, Rome, like taking a break from that to look afar to the Germans in their, in their freedom and uh, simplicity. Now, in fact, it's, it's not, he doesn't look at it with the rose-colored glasses, by the way. When you actually read it, it's, it's very uh, realistic and so on. But it is certainly true that he sees in Rome, obviously the, the biggest problem in Rome for him is the loss of liberty, the state of some degree of servitude in Rome. And it is true that in primitive places there can be a kind of uncivilized freedom which has a certain kind of appeal. Uh, this writing on Germans, which I'm going to say just a word now because I want to talk about the other two, so I'm just disposing of this one quickly, the middle one, uh, was, was uh, uh, of course very influential on Germans. You know? <laughs> it's, it's very interesting to reflect historically on the fact that, of course, the Germans were not definitively conquered by Rome, as the Gauls were. And this is a distinction between Germany and France. And if you are French, you believe that it was your great good fortune to be conquered by the Romans and civilized early. And if you're German, you like to boast that you were not enslaved by the Romans and therefore have developed better than the French. Uh, the Tacitus's Germaniae has, has been, has been uh, widely read with that uh, optic in mind, which of course is not his particular uh, intention. Uh, <clears throat> certainly one of his intentions in looking at Germany is, as he comments, Germany is the enemy which they have had to fought against, have had to fight against for a long time and many times and with great losses. Uh, many of us are familiar with the story about Augustus who after the three legions of commanded by Varus were destroyed in the Black Forest. Augustus used to wander the palace at night and say, Varus, give me back my legions. It was the greatest Roman defeat of the imperial era known to Tacitus. And so, so, so Tacitus evokes that view of, you can say, the, the outside of Rome right? and uh, 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 re reflects on its character, reflects also on uh, the fact that uh, uh, on, on issues about what the appropriate boundaries of the Roman Empire should be, uh, which obviously is a, is a matter of great interest. Uh, there's a passage actually in the Agricola uh, which reflects on the same issue, very brief. And this Agricola is the, the the, the center of the biography of Agricola is about his conquest of the Britons, uh, which, as you probably know, the conquest was launched by C Julius Caesar. Uh, and then, then it was pretty much on hold for a long time, and it gets, gets revived. And, and Agricola 
gets all the way up to the 